Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and actually, not just for inviting me uh, back to speak again this year, but also, as well as organizing this conference, Mark also uh, helped organize Indie Web Camp on the weekend, which was fantastic. So thank you for that, Mark. And I know I think some of the SIPgate people are back there where we had Indie Web Camp. And I want to thank them again. They did a fantastic job uh, doing it. So thank you, Mark and SIPgate. So yeah, as Mark said, I, I get the job of opening up day two. Well, this is known as the hangover slot, right? Uh, but I'll see what I can do. I'll tell you what, I'll open up day two of Beyond Tellerand with a story, or rather, a creation myth. Uh, you probably heard that the internet was created to withstand a nuclear attack, right? A network that would be resilient to withstanding a nuclear attack. And that, that's actually not quite true. What is true is that uh, Paul Baran, who was at the Rand Corporation, was looking into what is the most resilient shape of a network. And amongst his findings, one of the things he discovered that was that uh, by splitting up uh, uh, your, your information into discrete packages, uh, you made, it made for a more resilient network. And this is where this idea of packet switching comes from, that you, you take the entire message, chop it up into little packets, and then you ship those packets around the network by whatever route happens to be best, and then reassemble them at the other end. Now, this idea of packet switching that uh, Paul Baran was coming up with, that uh, came across the radar of Leonard Kleinrock, who was working on uh, the ARPANET, uh, or earlier the DARPANET from the uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, and this is the idea of linking up uh, uh, networks, effectively, computer networks. Now, this is really, really early days here. This is uh, 1969 is when the very first message was sent on the ARPANET, and it was simply an instruction to log in from one machine to another machine, but it crashed after two characters. So that was the first message ever sent on the ARPANET, which kind of was the precursor to the Internet. So they, they kept working on it, right? They, they ironed out the bugs, and this network of networks grew and grew over time throughout the 70s. But the point at which it really kind of morphed into being the internet was when they had to tackle the problem of making sure that all these different networks that were speaking different languages, using different programs, could all be understood by one another, that there needed to be some kind of low-level protocol that these, this internetwork could use uh, to make sure that these packages were all being shuttled around in an understandable way. And that's where these two gentlemen come in, Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, because they created TCP IP, right? Transfer Control Protocol, the Internet Protocol. Now, what's interesting is that Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, back then, they weren't concerned about making a network resilient to nuclear attack. They were young, idealistic men, and what they were concerned about was making a network that was resilient to any kind of top-down control. So that was kind of baked into the design of these protocols, that the network would have no center. The network has no single decision point. that You don't have to uh, you know, ask to add a node to the network. You can just do it. And I think that's really the, the secret sauce of the internet, is the fact that it is, by design, a dumb network. Right? What I mean by that is that the network doesn't care at all about the contents of those packets that are being switched around and moved around. It just cares about getting those packets uh, to their final destination. And no particular kind of information is prioritized over any other kind. Now, this, this turns out to be really, really powerful. So the whole idea is that TCP IP is as simple as possible. In fact, in the RFC, they even say that theoretically, you could implement TCP IP using two tin cans and a piece of string. Right? It's very, very low level. What you can then do on top of this low-level, dumb, simple protocol is add more protocols, more complex protocols. And you can just go ahead and create these, these extra protocols. You can create protocols for sending and receiving email, uh, Telnet, right? file transfer protocol, Gopher, all sitting on top of TCP IP. And again, if you want to create a new protocol, you can just do it. You don't have to ask for anyone's permission. Right? You just create a new protocol. The tricky thing is getting people to use your protocol. Right? Because then you really start to run into Metcalfe's law. Right? The, uh, the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of users of the network, right? which basically means the more people use a network, the more powerful it is. So like, the very first person who had a fax machine had you know, a 
completely useless thing. But as soon as one other had a person had a fax machine, it was twice as powerful, and so on. So you have to convince people to use the protocol you've just created that sits on top of TCP IP. And that was the situation with a protocol that was invented called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It was just one part of a, a three-part stack of a project called World Wide Web. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, as the, the protocol for sending and receiving information, URLs for addressability, and a very, very simple format, HTML, for putting links together, basically. Very, very simple. And these, these three pieces formed this World Wide Web project that was created by Tim Berners-Lee when he was working at CERN. What I kind of love is that, you know, at this point, it only exists on his computer, and he still called it the World Wide Web, you know. <laughs> he was pretty confident. Um, so there's all these different influences go into the creation of, of, uh, of the web, and I think part of it is, is where the web was created, because it was created here at CERN, which is just the most amazing place if you ever get the chance to go. It's, it's unbelievable what human beings are doing there, right? I mean, recreating the conditions at the start of the universe, smashing particles together near the speed of light in this 20-mile-wide ring under the border of France and Switzerland. Mind-blowing stuff. And, of course, there's lots and lots of data being generated. There's so much logistical overhead involved in just getting this started and building this machine and doing the experiments. So managing the information is, uh, is quite a problem, as, as you can as you can probably imagine. And this is the problem that Tim Berners-Lee was trying to tackle while he was there. He was a computer scientist at CERN. And he had this idea that hypertext could be a really powerful way of managing information. And this wasn't his first time trying to create some kind of hypertext system. In the 80s, he had tried to create a hypertext system called Inquire. It was named after this Victorian book on manners called Inquire Within Upon Everything. Uh, which I always thought would be a great name for the World Wide Web, right? Inquire within upon everything. So there's these different influences are feeding in. There's, there's his previous work with Inquire. There's the architecture of the Internet itself that he's going to put this other protocol on top of. There's the culture at CERN where it isn't business-driven, it's for pure scientific research, right? All of these things are feeding in and influencing Tim Berners-Lee. So he puts a proposal together, uh, and it doesn't have the sexiest title, right? He just called it Information Management, a Proposal. But uh, his, his boss at CERN, Mike Sendal, he must, have, he must have seen something in this, because he, he gave Tim Berners-Lee the green light by scrawling across the top, vague, but exciting. <laughs> and this is how the web came to, be, came to be made, vague, but exciting. And right from the start, Tim Berners-Lee understood that the trick wasn't creating the best protocol or uh, the best format. The trick was getting people to use it, right? And to accomplish that, I think, he had very keen insight. Just like TCP IP, he understood it needed to be as simple as possible. It's like that apocryphal Einstein quote, right? That everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, and that's probably going to help you to encourage people to, to use what you're building if it's just as simple as it could be but still powerful. And looking at those building blocks, right, the protocol, the addressability, the format, I think that's true of all these, these building blocks. Like, these are all flawed in some way. None of these are perfect, far from it, right? They all have issues. Uh, we've been fixing the issues for years. But they're all good enough, and they're all simple enough that the World Wide Web was able to take off in the way it did. I mean, let, just looking at one piece of this, let's just look at HTML. Right, it's very simple format. To begin with, uh, there was no you know, official version of HTML. It was just something Tim Berners-Lee threw together. There was a document called HTML Tags, presumably written by Tim Berners-Lee, that outlined the entirety of HTML, which was a total of 21 elements. That was it, 21 elements. And even those 21 elements, Tim Berners-Lee didn't, didn't invent. He didn't create them, most of them. Most of them he, he stole, he borrowed from an existing format. See, the people at CERN were already using a markup language called uh, CERN SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language. And so by taking what they were f already familiar with and putting that into HTML, it is more likely that people would use HTML. Now, what I find amazing is that we've gone from having 21 elements in, in HTML tags, that first document, to having 100 more elements now, and yet 
it's still the same language. I find that amazing. It's still the same language that was created 25 years ago. It's grown, right, an extra 100 elements in there, and yet it's still the same language. If you're familiar at all with you know, computer formats, this is very surprising. If you tried to open a word processing document from the same time as uh, when Tim Berners-Lee was creating the World Wide Web project, good luck, right? You'd probably have to run some emulation just to get the thing open. And yet you could open an HTML document from back then in a browser today. So how is it possible that this one language can grow over 25 years, grow a hundredfold? Well, I think it comes down to a design decision with a, how HTML is handled by browsers, by parsers. So, okay, we're going to get very basic here, but think for a minute about what happens when a browser sees an HTML element. You've got an opening tag, you've got a closing tag, you've got some content in between. Maybe there'll be some attributes on the opening tag, but this is basically an HTML element. And what a browser does is it displays the content in between the opening and closing tags. Now, for some elements it will do extra stuff. Some elements have you know, extra goodness, maybe it's styling, maybe it's behavior, right? The A element is very special. Uh, and so on, but by default, an HTML element just displays the content between the opening and closing tags. Okay, you, know, you all know this. What's interesting is what happens if you give a browser an HTML element that doesn't exist. It's not in HTML. The browser doesn't recognize it. Still got an opening tag, still got a closing tag, still got content in between. Well, what the browser does is it still shows that content in between the opening and closing tags. Okay, you all know this too. See, what's interesting is what the browser does not do. The browser does not throw an error to the user. The browser does not stop parsing the document at this point and refuse to parse any further. It just skips over what it doesn't understand, shows that content, and carries on to the next element. Well, this turns out to be enormously powerful. This is how we get to have 100 new elements since the birth of HTML. Because as we add new elements into the language, we know exactly how older browsers will behave when they see these new elements. They'll just ignore the tags they don't understand and display the content. That's how we can add to the language. In fact, we can make use of this design decision for some more complex elements. Like, let's take Canvas. If we know that an older browser will display the content between tags for elements it doesn't understand, that means we can put fallback content between those tags. And we can have newer browsers not display the content between the opening and closing tag. Very powerful. It means you get to use things like Canvas, video, audio, and still provide some fallback content. This is not an accident. This is by design. The Canvas element originally, that was a proprietary element created by Apple. As so often happens, uh, this is the way standards get done, is other browsers look at what a browser's doing, creating a proprietary thing, and goes, oh, that's a good idea, we're going to do that too, and they standardize on it. But when it was a proprietary element, it was a standalone element. It didn't have a closing tag, right? It was standalone like image or meta or link. But when it became standardized, they gave it a closing tag specifically so we could use this pattern, specifically so that we could put fallback content in there and safely use these new exciting elements but also provide fallback for older elements. So I really like that design pattern, right? There's been some real thought has gone into that. There's an interesting pattern I'd like to look at here as well, another HTML element. Now, the image element has a very interesting backstory. Um, looking at it, I mean, even, even from here, you can see, like, wait a minute, there's no closing tag. And it would actually be much better if we had an opening image tag, a closing image tag, and then we could put fallback content in between the opening and closing tags, like a text description of what's in the image. But no, instead we're stuck with this alt attribute where we have to put this fallback content. Seems like a bit of a weird design decision. Well, what happened was in the early days of the web, when everybody seemed to be making a web browser, there was this mailing list for all the people making web browsers. And you have to remember, back then there were no images on the web. But this topic came up. How could we have images on the World Wide Web? And it's being discussed, and they're throwing ideas backwards and forwards, like, oh, maybe it should be called icon, or maybe it should be called object, because maybe there'll be things other than images one day on the web. And this is all going on, and Mark Andreessen, who's making the Mosaic browser, he chimes in and goes, uh, listen, I've just shipped this. It's called IMG. You put the path in the SRC attribute, and uh, it's, it's, it's landing in the next version of Mosaic. And everyone else went, okay. 
because what they had was they had rough consensus, but more importantly, they had running code. And the running code kind of trumped any sort of theoretical purity. It did, does mean, though, we're stuck with these decisions. There's all sorts of weird stuff in HTML. You might wonder, why does it work that way and not another way? It usually goes back to some historical reason like that. Well, this worked well enough, right, that we have this image element for throwing in, say, bitmap images. But there is a certain clash between this inherent flexibility of the web when it comes to text and bitmap images that have an inherent width and, and height. Right? You put uh, text on the web, and it doesn't matter what the width of the browser is, it's just going to break onto multiple lines. Uh, the web's very flexible when it comes to text. When it comes to images, not so much, because images are so fixed. So there's kind of a, kind of a clash between the web and between bitmap images. And that really sort of came to a head with the rise of responsive design. It's like, oh shit, what are we going to do now? Like, we've got these fixed things, and yet sometimes we want to be different sizes. So the responsive images problem has been solved, and again, the design decisions there are very smart. So one way of solving is you've got the source set attribute now, right? And you can put in other images and say to the browser, look, here are some other images with a higher pixel density, for example, and let the browser choose. Or we've got this uh, picture element, you can wrap the image element in, and you can provide uh, even more images that the, the browser could choose from and provide media queries in there, all that stuff. But, 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 with both of those, you still have to have an image element. There's no way you can leave it out. If you try and use picture without an image element, it just won't work. And you have to have a source attribute, because the way that these things work, both the source set attribute and the source elements, is that they update the value of the SRC attribute in there, right? So you can't leave off that initial source attribute, which means you have to provide some backwards compatibility. If you try to just use the new stuff without using the good old-fashioned SRC attribute, it just won't work. That too is deliberate, and that's a really nice design decision. Right? Very forward thinking, but also making sure we know how things are going to behave in older browsers. So again, the reason why we can do this with HTML is because of how it handles errors, how it handles stuff it doesn't recognize. You give this to an older browser, it just skips over the picture stuff, the source stuff, sees the image. If it understands that, that's what it uses. And it doesn't throw an error, and it doesn't stop parsing the file at that point. So HTML is very uh, error tolerant, I guess. And it's, it's similar with, with CSS. It has a very similar way of, of handling errors. Now, CSS, um, you know, I know a lot of people, especially from the JavaScript world really like to hate on CSS, but I kind of I love CSS, and I'll tell you why. If you think about all the CSS that's out there, and there's a lot of CSS out there, because there's a lot of websites out there, and they're all using CSS. The possible combinations are endless, and yet all of it, all of it comes down to one pattern. Selectors, properties, values. That's it. That's all the CSS that's ever been written. One simple little pattern. The tricky part is, of course, you know, knowing the vocabulary of all the selectors and all the properties and all the values. But the underlying pattern is super simple. A couple of special characters so that the machines can parse it, but one underlying pattern behind all of the CSS ever written. I think that's really beautiful. And again, we've been able to grow CSS over time. Just add in new selectors, new properties, new values. And the reason we can do that is because of how browsers handle CSS that they don't understand. If you give a browser a, se a selector that doesn't exist, well, it's just like giving it a selector that doesn't match anything in the document. It just ignores that, that chunk of curly braces and skips on to the next one. If you give it a property it doesn't understand, it just skips on to the next declaration. If you give it a value, same thing. It doesn't throw an error, and it doesn't stop parsing the CSS and refuse to parse any further. So CSS, like HTML, very error tolerant. And what I find interesting about CSS lately, and when I say lately, I mean in the last, let's say, five years, if we look at the biggest changes in CSS, personally, I think they fall into kind of two categories. First of all, you've got preprocessors and postprocessors, right? But things like SAS and, and less. Uh, and then you've also got these naming conventions, right? These, these ways of organizing your CSS. OOCSS, BEM, SMAX, uh, there's a few more. It, who here is using some kind of naming convention like this? Right? Okay. And who here is using SAS or LESS or postprocessors? Right? Lots of us. See, what I find interesting about both of those revolutions in how we do CSS 
is that in neither case did we have to go to the browser makers or go to the standards body and, and lobby them and say, please add this to CSS. Right? With, the, with the preprocessors, it happens in our machines, so we don't need to worry about having anything needing to be implemented in the browser. And with the naming conventions, well, it kind of all happens in the selector, and nothing new needed to be ha added into a, a CSS for us to come up with these new ways of naming things and conventions for class names. In fact, even though it's only in the last few years that these things have become popular, in theory, there's no reason why we couldn't have been doing BEM 15 years ago, right? So it's almost like it was there, hiding in plain sight the whole time, staring us in the face in that simple pattern, and we just hadn't realized its potential. I find that fascinating. I want you to remember that, because I'm going to come back to this idea that, that something is just staring us in the face, hiding in, in plain sight. OK, so CSS and HTML can grow over time because they're error uh, tolerant. And I think that this is an example of what's known as the robustness principle. This is from John Postel. Be conservative in what you send. Be liberal in what you accept. Mr. DJ, you can use that as a sample. Be conservative <laughs> in what you send. Be liberal in what you accept. Because um, that's what browsers are doing. They're being variable. Okay. Awesome. So John Postel, uh, he, he worked on the internet. Um, and he was talking about that packet switching stuff when he came up with this, this principle. Like, if, if you're on the internet, you're, you're a machine on the internet, and you get given a packet you're supposed to shuttle on, and let's say there's errors in the packet, but you can still understand the, you know, what you're supposed to do with it, well, just shuttle it on anyway, even though there's errors, right? So be tolerant about that kind of stuff. But when you send packets out, try to make them well-formed, right? So be, be conservative in what you send, but be liberal in what you accept. Now, this might sound like it's a very technical uh, principle that only applies to things like networking or, or the creation of, of, of formats for computers, but I actually see Postel's law at work all the time in areas of, of design in the field of, of user experience. So let's say you've got a, a form you're going to put on the web. Well, you know, number one rule is try to keep the number of form fields to a minimum. Don't ask the user to fill in too many form fields. Keep it, keep it to a minimum, right? Be conservative in what you send. And then when the user is filling in those form fields, right, let's say it's telephone number or card, credit card number, don't make them format the form fields in a certain way. Just deal with it. Be liberal in what you accept. Now, CSS and HTML, I think, can afford to have this, this uh, robustness principle and this uh, error-tolerant uh, handling built in, partly because of the kind of languages they are. Because CSS and HTML are both declarative languages. In other words, you don't give step-by-step -step instructions to the browser on how to render something when you write CSS or HTML. You're just declaring what it is, right? You're declaring what the content is with HTML. You're declaring your desired outcome in CSS. And it's worth remembering, every line of CSS you write is a suggestion to the browser, not a command, right? Um, so they're declarative languages, so they can kind of afford to be uh, error tolerant. That's not true when it comes to JavaScript, and I'm talking specifically here about client-side JavaScript, JavaScript in a web browser. Uh, it's an imperative language where you do give step-by-step -step instructions to the computer about what you want to happen. And that really can't, a language like that can't afford to have loose error handling. So with JavaScript, if you give it something it doesn't understand, it will throw an error. It will stop parsing the JavaScript at that point and refuse to parse any further in the file. It kind of has to. I mean, if you had a, an imperative language that was very error tolerant, you'd never be able to debug anything, right? You make a mistake and, and the browser's like, ah, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it, you know? It, you kind of need to have that, that uh, well, frankly, more fragile error handling. It's the price you pay. The thing is, imperative languages are, are by their nature, more powerful because you get to decide a lot more. Uh, declarative languages, like I said, you're just kind of making suggestions what you'd like to happen. What that means is that declarative languages can afford to be more resilient, whereas imperative languages, I think, are inherently more fragile. I think there are other differences, too. In my experience, declarative languages are far easier to learn. The learning curve is, is pretty shallow, whereas an imperative language has a much steeper learning curve, kind of because you've got to get all, your head around all these concepts like variables and loops and, and all sorts of stuff before you can even uh, start writing. What I've noticed over time, though, sort of looking at the history of the web, 
is that when we're trying to solve problems, when we run up against things like the responsive images problem will be one example, we initially start solving it up at the fragile uh, end, end of the stack, right? We, we solve it with scripts. And when we've got something working well enough, it, over time it finds its way down into the more resilient part of the stack, into CSS or into HTML. Like, if you can remember when we first started writing JavaScript way back in the day, uh, the two most common use cases were rollovers, right? You mouse over an image, it swaps out for a different image. Uh, and uh, form fields, like, uh, has a required form field been filled in? Does this actually look like an email address? Stuff like that. Now, these days, you wouldn't even use JavaScript to do that stuff, right? Because to do rollovers, you'd use CSS, because that functionality found its way into the declarative language through the pseudo classes. And if you want to make sure that a required field is being filled in, you can do that in HTML, right, by adding the required attribute. So you see this over time, that we solve stuff initially in the, in the imperative layer, the, the fragile part in JavaScript, and they find, those patterns find their way down into the declarative stack over time. So JavaScript, by its nature, because of its error handling, you kind of have to be, you have to be a bit more careful in how you use it. It's just the nature of the beast. What's interesting is that, again, looking back at the history of the web, there was a moment about 10 years ago when we almost had the worst of both worlds. If anyone remembers, uh, PPK knows what I'm talking about. XHTML2, the idea here was, okay, well, so we already had XHTML1. And all that was was taking the, the syntax of XML and applying it to HTML. Because in HTML, it doesn't matter whether your tags are uppercase or lowercase. It doesn't matter if your attributes are uppercase, lowercase. It doesn't matter if you quote your attributes. Whereas in XHTML, they, you know, it has to be all lowercase elements, all lowercase attributes. Always quote your uh, attributes. So the idea of taking the syntax and applying it to HTML was kind of a nice thing because it made our HTML cleaner and it kind of showed a bit of professionalism, right? So that was XHTML1. It didn't fundamentally make any difference to the browsers, uh, whether you used an old version of HTML or used XHTML1. It was all the same. But the idea with XHTML2 was that as well as borrowing the syntax from XML, we would also borrow the error handling of XML. And here's the error handling of XML. If there's a single mistake in the document, don't parse the document. Don't show anything to the end user. So really draconian error handling, right? Now, web developers, designers, authors, us, we took one look at this and we said, no, that's insane. Why would we put stuff on the public web where if there's one unencoded ampersand, right, <clears throat> you're going to get a yellow screen of death and the user's not going to see anything. That's madness, right? So we quite rightfully rejected XHTML2 because of its draconian error handling. Here we are, 10 years later. And we're putting our base content, like text on a screen, into the most fragile layer of the stack. We are JavaScripting all the things. What changed? Right? I mean, we decided 10 years ago that that kind of, fragile, that, that kind of draconian error handling was just way too fragile. It wasn't resilient enough for the public web. But I missed the memo. We decided that if you want to render some text on a screen, it, you should use an imperative programming language to do that, where if you make one mistake, nothing's going to get rendered. And mistakes do happen. Remember a couple of years back where the, the page for downloading Google Chrome, pretty important page, wasn't working at all. Nobody in the world could download Google Chrome for a few hours. And the reason is because of this link to download Google Chrome. You can see there's, a, there's an error in, in JavaScript somewhere, probably completely unrelated uh, error, but this is the way that the link had been marked up. In other words, taking that fragile, imperative part of the stack and pushing it down into the more resilient uh, part of the stack and, and getting the worst of both worlds, right? Using this JavaScript pseudo protocol means that it's not actually a link. It's kind of just a pathway to the fragility of a scripting language. This illustrates another law that in some ways is just as important as Postel's law, and that is Murphy's law. Anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. Uh, he was a real person. He was an aerospace engineer. And because he had this attitude, uh, he never lost anybody on his watch. <clears throat> and like Postel's law, I see Murphy's law in action all the time, and particularly when it comes to client-side JavaScript because of the way it handles errors, right? Uh, Stuart Langridge put together a 
a sort of flowchart of all the things that can possibly go wrong with JavaScript. And some of these things are uh, in the browser, and some of them are in the network, and some of them are in the uh, server, things that go wrong. And of course, things can go wrong with your HTML and your CSS and your images too, but because of the error handling of those things, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, with JavaScript, it's going to stop parsing the entire JavaScript file if you've got one single error, or if something goes wrong on the network, or if the browser doesn't support something that you've assumed it supported, right? So it's inherently more fragile. And we need to embrace that. We need to accept that shit happens. We need to accept that Murphy's Law is real. We need to take you know, a pretty resilient approach to, to how we treat that fragile layer of the stack, the imperative layer. Uh, like, could you imagine if car manufacturers who currently you know, spend a lot of time strapping crash test dummies into cars and smashing them against walls at high speed, if they said, you know what, actually we're not going to strap crash test dummies into our cars and smash them into walls at high speed, because we've been thinking, and actually, we don't think crash test dummies are going to drive these cars. We think they'll be driven by people. Also, we don't anticipate people are going to drive their cars into the wall at high speed. We think they'll drive on roads. It's like, yeah, of course, that's what we hope will happen, but you still got a plan for the worst case scenario. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. That's not a bad thing, that's just good engineering. Trent Walton wrote about this. He said, like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or on icy roads, websites should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. The reality of the web's inherent variability. We need to face that reality. Stop pretending, stop assuming that, oh, well, everyone's got JavaScript. Oh, that JavaScript will be fine. You know, th those, those are assumptions. We need, to, we need to push those assumptions and accept that there is variability, that Murphy's Law is real. Well, this all sounds very depressing, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like I've come here to, to give you doom and, indeed, gloom. Say, so, oh, we're all doomed. Don't use JavaScript, which is not what I'm saying at all. Far from it. I love JavaScript. No, I think we just need to be a bit more careful about how we deploy it. And I've got a, I've got a solution for you. I want to give you my three-step plan for building websites. Here's how I do it. Step one, identify the core functionality of the service, the product you're building. Step two, make that core functionality available using the simplest possible technology. And step three, enhance, which is where the fun is, right? You want to be spending your time at step three, but take a little time with step one and two. Um, Let's go through this. OK, let's, let's look at the first bit. Identify the core functionality. Let's say you're providing the news. Well, there you go. There's your core functionality, providing the news. That's, that's it. There's loads more you can do as well as providing the news, but when you really stop and think about what the core functionality is, it's just providing the news. Let's say you've got a, a social network, a messaging service where people can send and receive messages from all over the world. Well, I would say the ability to send a message, the ability to receive a message, that's the core functionality. Again, there's lots more we can do, but that's the core functionality. You want to make sure that anybody in the world can do that. If you have a photo sharing app, the clue is in the name. The ability to share photos. Uh, I need to be able to see photos. I need to be able to share a photograph. And let's say you've got some writing tool where you can write and edit and collaborate on documents. Well, there's your core functionality right there, the ability to write and edit documents. OK, now that you've identified the core functionality, make that functionality available using the simplest technology. And by the simplest technology, what it means you're probably wanting to look as far down the stack as you can go, right? Uh, so going back to the news site, providing the news is the core functionality. I mean, theoretically, the simplest technology to do that would be a plain text file. Uh, I'm going to go one level up from that, though, and I'm going to say an HTML file. So we structure that news, and we put it out there on the web. That's it. That's how we make the core functionality available using the simplest possible technology. That social networking site, we need to be able to send messages, we need to be able to receive messages. Well, to see messages, probably in reverse chronological order, HTML can do that. To send messages, we can do that too using forms, right? So a simple form field should cover that. All right, you've got done the core functionality. Uh, for the photo sharing app, very similar. Again, reverse chronological list, but this time we need to have images in there. So our baseline is a little bit higher now. Uh, the browser needs to support images. And instead of a, a form field for accepting text, we're going to have a form field for accepting an image. As far as I can tell, that's the simplest possible technology to do this. And for this collaborative writing tool, the ability to write and edit documents, 
uh, a text area, a form. Okay. Now, if you were to stop at this point, what you have would work, but it would be kind of shitty. Okay. The fun happens at step three, where you get to enhance. You take your, your, your baseline and you enhance up. This is where you get to differentiate. This is where you stand out from the competition. This is where you get to play with the cool toys. You get to make something much nicer. So with something like providing the news, well, uh, providing layout on larger screens, there's the enhancement right there. Now, it might be odd to think about layout as an enhancement, but if you think about responsive design, and particularly mobile-first responsive design, that's exactly what layout is. Right? You begin with the content, and then in your media queries, you add the layout as an enhancement. Uh, and you want it to look beautiful, so we can use web fonts to do that, right? I would love to think that the beautiful typography is inherent to the content, but we have to accept the reality that it's an enhancement. And that's not to belittle it. Don't think when I say, oh, this is an enhancement, that I'm saying this is just an enhancement. The enhancements are where the differentiation lies, where things really shine. So in the case of our social networking, messaging service, it's sending and receiving messages, it's full page refreshes, it's really dull, it's really boring, uh, we're going to bring in some Ajax so that we don't need to refresh the page all the time to see the latest messages. And we could even make it work the other way, right? We can use web sockets so that the, you know, the sending and receiving, we never need to refresh the page again. We get those messages arriving all the time. Now, not every, not every browser is going to support web sockets. That's okay because the core functionality is still available to everyone. The experience will be different, it'll be worse in older browsers, but they can still accomplish something. That's the key part. In the case of our uh, photo sharing app, all the things we said before, right? We're gonna have layout, we're gonna have uh, web fonts, we're gonna have Ajax, we're gonna have web sockets, and let's play on with even more stuff, newer stuff, the file API, that the moment that file is in the browser, we can, before we even send it to the server, we can start playing around with it. We can do things like CSS filters, put sepia tones on those images, let the user play with that. Again, not every browser supports this stuff, that's okay, the core functionality is there. You're layering this stuff on. And in the case of this collaborative writing tool, all the stuff I mentioned before, you definitely want to have Ajax in there, you definitely want to have all that other good stuff, web sockets. But let's make sure it's resilient to network failures. Let's start storing stuff in the browser itself. We've got all different kinds of local storage these days. I can't even keep up with the many databases we have in a browser. Uh, local storage and making it work offline. I mean, this is the technology I'm probably most excited about right now, service workers. Very, very exciting. I mean, properly game-changing stuff and you know when I was talking about those patterns earlier, like Canvas, like Image, and the way they've been designed with backwards compatibility in mind? Service Worker has been designed to be an enhancement like this. You can't make Service Worker a requirement for a website. You have to add it as a, an enhancement, because the first time someone hits your website, there is no Service Worker. So that, again, is a design decision, and that encourages the adoption of technologies like Service Worker. It's a very clever move. And that's how you make websites, that three-step uh, process. And what I like about this three-step process is that it's scale-free, which means it works. I've just been talking about the level of the whole service, right? The, the, the product or the service you're building. But you could apply this at different scales. You could apply it at the scale of a URL. You could ask, what is the core functionality of this URL? How do I make the, that functionality available using the simplest possible technology? Uh, and how can I then enhance it, right? And you can go deeper and at the level of a component within a page, say, okay, what's the simplest way of, of making this component work and then uh, how do I enhance it from there? Um, the filament group talked about this, like just providing an address. Well, the simplest way is some text with the address on it, but then you could add an image with a map on it and then you could add Slippy Map for more advanced browsers and then you could add animation, all sorts of good stuff. You can layer this stuff on. My point here is that there isn't a dichotomy between either having the basic functionality, which is available to everyone, but it's but quite boring, or a rich, immersive experience with all the cool APIs and, and the new stuff. I'm saying you can have both. By taking this layered approach, you can have both. And there's a myth with this, the idea that, yeah, but this means I'm gonna spend all my time in older browsers, right? If I'm concentrating on, on backwards compatibility. No, far from it. As long as you spend time making steps one and two work, I find I spend all my time in step three because I know exactly what's going to happen in older browsers. They're going to get the basic core functionality. And I get to play around with the new stuff, the new toys, the new APIs, kind of with a clear conscience, right? It's kind of the safest way of playing with stuff, even when it's only supported in one or maybe two browsers. You're going to spend more time in newer browsers if you do this. 
But I do get pushback on this, and the pushback falls into sort of two categories. One, that this is too easy, or rather, it's too simplistic, it's, it's naive, right? It's like, oh yeah, well, that's what you're talking about, that will work for a simple blog or a personal site, but it couldn't possibly scale for the really complicated app, the really complicated corporate site that I'm building. Um, what's interesting is that I heard that argument before, when we were trying to convince people to switch from using tables for layout and font tags to using CSS, I remember people saying, yes, those examples you've shown, it's all well and good for a simple little blog or a personal site, but it could never scale to a big corporate site. And then we got Wired.com, we got ESPN.com, and the floodgates opened, right? And when responsive design came along, Ethan got exactly the same thing. It's like, well, Ethan, that's all well and good for your own little website, this responsive design stuff, but it couldn't possibly scale to a big corporate site. And then we had the Boston Globe with Microsoft.com, and the floodgates opened again. But the other pushback I get is that this is too hard. It's too difficult. And I have some sympathy for this, because people look at this three-step process and they're like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're saying I spend my time making the stuff work in the old-fashioned client-server model, and then at step three, when I start adding in my JavaScript, I'm just going to recreate the whole thing again, right? Not quite. I think there could possibly be some duplicated work. But remember, you're just making sure that the core functionality is available to everyone. What you do then after that, all the other functionality you add in, you don't need to make that available to everyone. Again, talking about the Boston Globe, I remember Matt Marquis saying, you know, there's a whole bunch of features on the Boston Globe that require JavaScript to work. Reading the news is not one of them. But I think this could be harder at first. If you're not used to working this way, it's fair enough to say, yeah, this is, this is hard. But again, that was true when we moved from tables to layout, for layout to CSS. It was harder. At least the first time we tried it, it was harder. Second time, it got easier. Third time, easier still. And now, it's just the default. And I couldn't make a website with tables for layout if I tried. And if you'd been making fixed width websites for years, then yeah, the first time you tried to make a responsive website, it was really painful. The second time was probably still painful, but not as painful. And by the third time, it gets easier. And now, it's just the default way you build websites. So it's the same here. You just got to get used to it. But I still find people push back. I'm like, ah, oh, this is too hard. This doesn't work with the tools I'm using. I hate that argument because the tools are supposed to be there to support you. The tools are supposed to be there to make you work better. That's why you choose a library. That's why you choose a framework. You don't let a framework or library dictate to you how you approach building a website. That's the tail wagging the dog. And yet, I see again and again that people choose developer convenience over user needs. Now, I don't want to belittle developer convenience. Developer convenience is hugely important, but not at the expense of user needs. There has to be a balance here. I've said it often, but if I'm given the option, if there's a problem, and I have the choice of making it the user's problem or making it my problem, I'll make it my problem every time. You know why? That's my job. That's why it's called work. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes it is harder. And we've seen this. We've seen this over and over again, that we're constantly complaining about what we can't do. It's like, ah, we're not there yet. The web, the web kind of sucks when you compare it to Flash, or the web kind of sucks when you compare it to native. It goes back a long way, right? I remember when we were like, ah, the web sucks because I've only got 216 colors to play with. True story, 216 colors, that's all we had, right? Or the web sucks because I've only got these system fonts uh, to work with, with typography, right? Or, ah, everything will be so much better if people would just upgrade from Netscape 4, if people would just upgrade from Internet Explorer 6, then everything would be fine. If only people would upgrade from Windows XP, if those Android 2 users would just upgrade, then everything would be fine, right? It's like. This keeps happening over and over again, right? We're never happy. My friend, uh, my friend Frank has a, a wonderful essay he wrote a few years back. It's called, There is a Horse in the Apple Store. <laughs> Wherein he describes the situation, true story, it really happened, there is a horse in the Apple Store. And he describes what it's like to see a horse in the Apple Store. But he also describes the reaction, or complete lack thereof, by all the people in the Apple Store. It's like, don't they see the tiny horse in the Apple Store? It's right in front of their faces, but they just don't see it. And I think we kind of have let that happen with the web. So Frank calls things like this tiny, tiny ponies. When something is amazing, but it's right in front of you and you don't see it, it's a tiny pony. And I think the World Wide Web is a tiny pony, right? It's amazing. 
And yet we're like, oh, can't get 60 frames per second, oh, right? It's incredible. The web is incredible. And you know why it's incredible? It's not because of HTTP, and it's not even because of HTML, much as I love it. The web is incredible because of URLs. URLs mean there are plenty of other formats and plenty of other uh, protocols on the internet for sending and receiving messages, for keeping people in touch. Some of them are better than the web at that stuff, but only the web has URLs. Only the web allows you to put something online and keep it there over time so that people can access it throughout history. That's amazing. And also, you build an application. You build something that people can use. You can put it on the web just by putting it at a URL. You don't need to ask anyone's permission. There's no app store. There's no gatekeeper. URLs are the beating heart of the World Wide Web. And the fact that we can build up the store of knowledge is amazing. We can extend the reach of our networks for future generations. We can extend the reach of the collective knowledge of our species. So we need to be good ancestors, and we need to leave behind a web that lasts, a web that's resilient. Thank you.